What's going on, everyone? Welcome back to another episode of the Weekly Film with the Bunk Bed Bros. You got Noah at FB God over there with the new hairstyle buns on his head. You got it's a me. throwback. It's a throwback episode. Like, <laughs> it's a, yeah, exactly. It's a throwback. You got me at Mike Me Up with two Ps. Um, if you guys want to head on over there to Twitter and follow us and then make sure you uh, subscribe to the channel as well. If you are watching this from the main BDG channel, our YouTube channel, Bunk Bed Breakdowns. Uh, so you can head on over there and hit the subscribe button. If you like the video, hit the thumbs up. If you don't like it, hit the comments and let us know why. Uh, but today we got, we got, we're going to do a series going forward. It's going to be called versus. And what we're going to do is pit pit players against each other that are kind of close in ADP and give you our take on who we'd rather take and why. And sometimes, you know, no, and I will agree. Sometimes we won't agree. Uh, but even if we do agree, we'll, we'll play a little devil's advocate to kind of just make sure we cover all our bases and think about both sides. Um, but before we do that, man, Noah, How's it going? I see you're rocking some bling today. Uh, NBA Top Shots obviously made you rich. It's your change, man. Now you got. Yeah, you got I told the... people, you know, if, if you think it's financial advice on that account, just know it's not because this is a fake chain. And if it was a real <laughs> chain, then maybe I'd be giving real financial advice. We're just having a lot of fun talking Top Shot, talking Dynasty, just trying to help you guys out in the long run. That's what it's all about. Just building a community and helping people out in the long run. So hopefully these this versus episode can help you guys in the long run make decisions when you're on the clock. We're just looking over dynasty trades and somebody offers you Aaron Jones for Joe Mixon. You come back to this video and you see the points that we make about him. Yep. Yep. It's all we're about, man. We're giving you information. At the end of the day, it's your decision. You know, I, like I always say, it, it's always better for me at least to like lose on my own decision than to like lose on someone else's, right? Nothing feels worse than like you have a gut feeling. You listen to like a podcast and one of us nerds in the industry is like, well, well, I think that based on the numbers, you have to go this way. And then you, you know, obviously make the decision, trying to be the wrong one. And then you hate yourself for it. So at the end of the day, just make your own decision. We're just going to provide you the info that we have and, you know, we'll kind of go from there. But uh, before we get started though, you know what time it is. All right, first up, uh, let's go. Let's go from the top down, top of the draft down a little bit more. After that, first up, we got Saquon Barkley and Alvin Kamara. Saquon Barkley, current goal as BDGE mock draft February ADP based on seventy two samples as the RB three. Alvin Kamara going as the RB five. Uh, so I, what I will say is, you know, I have Barkley very high personally. Uh, but you know, I've seen other ADPs. I've seen DLF ADP, I think had him at like the back end of the first. So he was like RB five down there. And then, you know, sometimes I see Kamara and Cook go ahead of them. So it's a little bit, uh, you know, depending on where you are or what leagues you're in, like it might be a little bit different, but basically we're talking like two of the top tier one assets here. Um, Noah, which one are you going to take? Yeah. So I think if you look at it from the perspective, if, if you're contending, you probably want Alvin Kamara because he's going to be top three, top five running back. Whereas Saquon Barkley does have that upside, but he brings longevity and his ceiling might be a little bit more capped being part of that New York Giants offense. But just looking at it objectively from player A versus player B, I still think I want Alvin Kamara because in the long run, right, they're two years age difference, but I don't think that really matters all too much because I think the highs that Alvin Kamara will bring you in the short term might outplay Saquon Barkley in the long, long run. And I also think that, you know, we've seen back-to-back -back years where Saquon Barkley has went down with injury. And sure, he he and Kamara suffered the same injury in 2019 with a high ankle sprain. We just saw Saquon Barkley go down with an ACL tear. And that's not to me saying that he's an injury-prone player and I'm fading him because of that. It's just another reason why I would prefer Alvin Kamara. And obviously there's a little bit up in the air with the quarterback situation in New Orleans, right? We don't know if Drew Brees is back. I don't even know if he's like announced his retirement. All I know is he cried on the field and then Tom Brady threw his son a pass. So that's probably the last time they're going to catch a pass on an NFL field and it's not even from their dad. But even if he's not there, right? Taysom Hill in a full off season, you really think Sean Payton is going to go through a full entire NFL season in the NFC South where they don't play defense and just tell his quarterback to run 20 times a game. I think it's similar to what we saw in New York where Daniel Jones didn't really target Saquon Barkley all too heavily in his rookie year. He was on pace for 65 receptions, and that's not too much for a guy like Saquon Barkley. He comes back this year. They have a whole offseason to prepare. And Saquon Barkley, week one, nine targets, six catches, 60 yards. Week two, he gets hurt. I think we should expect the same things where if we look at the four-game sample where Taysom Hill was starting this past season, 
you know, he wasn't throwing to Alvin Kamara a lot. He was also thrown into the fire halfway through the year. And I think most people probably even Taysom Hill expected Jameis Winston to take over the reins when Drew Brees went down. So full off season, a guy like Alvin Kamara, who is the best asset on that offense, Michael Thomas, I can guard you. So switch your at, I think that they're going to want to throw him the ball early and often. And we obviously all know his touchdown upside is there. And in the face of pretty bad situations over these past few years, playing through injury, playing through quarterback injuries, he has been elite. And this year with Drew Brees going down and being pretty washed and then Taysom Hill he put up 21 touchdowns and he had the most yards from scrimmage he's had in his entire career. So not taking anything away from Saquon Barkley, I would just bet on a guy who is in a much better offense in a pretty soft division with a great offensive mind, albeit two years older, but has shown to be pretty sustainable and a top five asset even when sharing a field with like washed up Mark Ingram and Adrian Peterson and just playing himself into a pretty big role and a very viable fa- a fantasy viable role. And also he kind of has that like status where animal ripped his shirt open and said, Alvin Kamara, like, you got to take that into consideration. That just adds an extra element into his tier one ability. Yeah. So I have a different little bit of a different view on this, but what I, what I will caveat this with is Alvin Kamara is elite, right? I mean, I think, you know, for those of us that aren't old timers and, you know, weren't around for the Barry Sanders and, and, you know, Walter Payton days, I feel like Alvin Kamara is really that for us in terms of like his contact balance, just watching him play, like watching him absorb contact and absorb tackles and somehow never fall to the ground is actually pretty incredible. Right. But in, in, in each of his years, Alvin Kamara has never had less than 80 catches. So, you know, if you're playing in PPR formats, you're, you're that's like, that's the gold mine right there. And that's why he's going to hold value long-term, um, you know, long-term, like going forward. But having said that, I think Saquon Barkley's a generational talent. I think we've kind of forgotten a little bit, you know, about how good he really is because, you know, he had that absolutely disgusting uh, start to the season, you know, with Daniel Jones, the Giants are an absolute freaking dumpster fire, but the Giants have always been a dumpster fire in my eyes. Um, they, they've, they have not been good uh, for a very, very long time. And Daniel Jones is not very good. And, you know, and when he was not very good, Saquon Barkley in his rookie year finished like a couple points off from the RB1 overall. And then even in the year where he like kind of had a high ankle sprain and then came back, you know, down the stretch, he was still an absolute monster. Um, I don't think he, they played he, together in Saquon's rookie year, though. No, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not saying rookie years. I'm saying in the second year, though, when, when he had uh, Daniel Jones, he had like a high ankle sprain and he came back. Um, uh, that you don't you remember what I'm talking about? Like he had like a high ankle sprain, mm-hmm. and then yeah. he missed like a few games and he came back, and he started off slow. But then like towards the end of the season, he was just an absolute monster again. I think there's just like too much volume there uh, for me to fade him. And if I'm just thinking about dynasty, I think you know if if the New Orleans Saints solve a position at quarterback, it's possible that Alvin Kamara finishes as the RB one overall again. Uh, that's definitely possible. But I'm also thinking like long term. I don't think the gap is like that big. Uh, for me to pass on someone like a Saquon Barkley because I'm still kind of getting the age, uh, the age factor with Barkley. And I think the injuries is like kind of a little bit overblown. I mean, I've been going on a Saquon Barkley shopping spree for a long time. Basically, as soon as he got injured uh, on any team that I was not a top contender, I was going for him. So, you know, I gave up like Dalvin Cook uh, for him in one league. I gave up, uh, you know, Zeke for him in one league before Zeke was trash and Dak got hurt. Um, I gave up, you know, I gave up Alvin Kamara. Uh, for like Saquon Barkley plus uh, during the peak of Alvin Kamara's powers last year to extending team. So I just think like people have forgotten a little bit. It's been a while, right? Since we've seen Saquon Barkley do Saquon Barkley things. And I'd believe Saquon Barkley will continue to do Saquon Barkley things. And I would not be shocked at all if he finished as the RB1 overall this year. And if he did, uh, and even if he finished close enough to Alvin Kamara, I think by this time next year, uh, he'll probably be like that top spot. Um, so between him and CMC, if there were if there was like one guy that you know really threatens him, really threatens uh, in terms of finishing his RB one overall over like a CMC, I would I would probably bet on Barkley before I would Kamara because I'm not I'm like not bought in on Taysom Hill and I'm gen- genuinely concerned. Like in the games with Taysom Hill, he had like two good games and then two really bad games. Right, he had you know the first two games he had with Taysom Hill, he was scoring like five points. I think. He had like, you know, maybe one target the first game, two targets the second game. Um, and then he had like three targets uh, the, the game after that. And then he had one game with like 10 targets. So the one game against Philly was like really the only game that Alvin Kamara kind of got unleashed. And he had seven catches for like 44 yards, which is like, which is good, but not, not elite. And if you look at like his scoring, he's, he's, still, he's scoring like the high double digit teens. But, you know, the ceiling that you want from Alvin Kamara is like 30, 40-point games, and that's what you got with Drew Brees. 
I don't really see it with Taysom Hill just because he's not a someone that's looking to throw on like third and short. He's looking to run similar to like Jalen Hurts and, and Lamar Jackson, except he's like an even worse passer. And then you also have on the goal line, which is where Alvin Kamara absolutely cleaned up Taysom Hill vulture, like a bunch of TDs. So th- those factors kind of makes me a little bit wary of Alvin Kamara, you know, and kind of like, it sounds stupid to say, right? Cause he's just such a good player and he's so elite and you shouldn't really fade players that good. And I'm not saying fade him, but if I had to choose uh, Saquon Barkley at his cost versus Alvin Kamara at his, I would rather choose Saquon Barkley. Like Saquon Barkley is my running back too. I have him in that same grouping with like CMC and Patrick Mahomes. I think he is that good. And I think he's going to remind people that he's that good again when he comes back. And we've seen the, the, mo- the wonders of modern sports medicine where Adrian Peterson comes back from an ACL and he's somehow better than he was before. I don't know what kind of drugs they're feeding these guys, but I'm sure, I'm sure there's a pretty expensive one. So for me, I'm going with Saquon Barkley. For you, obviously, it's Kamara because you're betting on a better offense. All of that, super legit. They have a better O-line. Giants still stink. So I think it's just a matter of preference, I, I think, up to, uh, up to the viewers here uh, for what they want. But Wait, I'm, we just I'm, got I'm, a message in from Snacks. He says... Oh, okay, he chooses Saquon Barkley, so it's two to one. I think I think you win this <laughs> argument, Mike. I think the main takeaway here, though, is if you can get anything on top of either piece, if you can trade Saquon for Kamara and a pick, or you can trade Kamara for Saquon and a pick, take whichever side has more assets because they are very close. And I think point number two is just fade running backs till round fifteen and take Joshua Kelly because he's going to be the <laughs> fucking goat this year. That man is a goal line back and he has hands. So I think you know talking about kind of fat running backs and a little bit less talented players than these two who are more one-dimensional brings us to our next grouping nick chubb derrick henry mike i know you love yourself some nick chubb and i know you hated yourself some derrick henry it's all right i've been through it i had an intervention with myself and nick just looking in a mirror and saying you know what we shouldn't be fading a guy who just rushes for 2k (laughs) every single game we should be fading a guy who just puts his hand through earl thomas's back and turns him to his own teammate (laughs) mid-run i think you know, here it's it's tough because they are also going very close to each other. We have Nick Chubb as the RB7. Derrick Henry is the RB9. And it's really unlike me to favor a fatter running back and an older running back. But guess what? We're back and we're doing it again. I do like Derrick Henry slightly more. Now, these guys are extremely close. They may even be closer for me than Kamara and Saquon Barkley are. It's just, oh, a little change of scenery. It's just the fact that I think, you know, Derrick Henry, sure, he's two years older and he has 500 more touches on his body which isn't great, but I don't see him slowing down at all. And the crazy thing about Derrick Henry is as the season goes on, he doesn't slow down. The guy ran for 2,000 yards in week 17. It was like, or it was week 16. I don't know, whichever week he played his final game. They're like, okay, he needs 226 yards for 2,000 yards from, or 2,000 rushing yards. It wasn't even a question. People <laughs> were like, okay, I'm betting the over on 227 and a half. Like 2,000 yards is ridiculous. 226 being penciled in in one game is even more egregious, and it just happened. It's just clockwork. Derrick Henry gets the ball, he goes for 70. I had to eat some words. I had to eat some tweets. I had to eat a whole lot of dog shit because I did stomp on Derrick Henry. And if he ever sees me in real life, I'm going to be in a locker real quick. But just looking at the context of the situation, sure, Arthur Smith leaves. Sure, Johnny Smith's a free agent. Sure, Corey Davis is a free agent. Both of those guys are really good blockers, and Arthur Smith is really good at employing a play-action type of offense and getting Derrick Henry a lot of touches how I look at it, and maybe it's not rational, it's kind of the same argument I made for Taysom Hill, is when you have an entire offseason, albeit around a new system with a new offensive coordinator there, I don't see a reason for them to go away from Derrick Henry. I don't know exactly who their offensive coordinator is. I don't think it's Todd Downing. I don't know what he's done other than in 2017, he had Marshawn Lynch, who was washed up on the Oakland Raiders. I don't see any reason for this Todd Downing guy to say, you know what, Derrick Henry, you're going to get 215 touches this year. We're not going to pound you up the middle 15, 20, 25 times a game. We're not going to give you 30 goal line carries. I think his upside this year is immense. And I think, you know, two or three years down the line, sure, he can start to slowly decline. But slowly declining from 2,000 rushing yards and 20 touchdowns or whatever is ridiculous. And I know Nick Chubb is kind of in that same mold as a Derrick Henry. But my concern there, aside from, I guess you could like, right off this season with injuries right and then in college he blew out his knee but he had a pretty healthy stretch in between that so I don't think it's fair to call him injury prone I think the only concern there is sure he's really really good and he's definitely better than Kareem Hunt but Kareem Hunt is signed through 2023 Nick Chubb is signed through 2021 he's going to have to get extended which he probably will but if Kareem Hunt's there for the next two or three years Kevin Stefanski can run all he wants the upside and the ceiling of Nick Chubb is going to be capped as long as Kareem Hunt is on the field so Although Nick Chubb is a little bit younger, 
although he might have a little bit more juice left in the tank, I don't think those years where he can capitalize on being younger is going to turn into him having as much upside as a Derrick Henry. Like, sure, he could be the RB8, the RB7, the RB6, and that's that's fantastic. But being the RB2 or RB3 for the next two years, me personally, if I'm contending, I'll take that. And the other thing is, if you're rebuilding, you're probably not buying either one of these guys. So I think if you are in the market for either one, I'd much rather go for Derrick Henry, who's probably, and we saw it by the ADP, is at a cheaper price. So that's what I'm going with here. Yeah, I think, you know, you could you could definitely make a case for both. And if if I'm ranking, I actually have Nick Chubb and Derrick Henry both lower because I, I tend to value the youth a lot more. Like you said, right, you either have to make a choice between really pushing their chips all in for someone like a Derrick Henry, or you can like go like the slightly more conservative, like, you know, extend your shelf life path and grab me some of the younger guys. I tend to favor that path a little bit more. But if I'm just choosing between these two guys, uh, I'm going to pick Nick Chubb still just from a value perspective, but I think, you know, you made a great point, which is if you are a contending team, I think Derrick Henry has a, might have a bigger impact in terms of your ability to win. But I just want to remind people, right? Like Nick Chubb last year and Derrick Henry were like head to head, uh, for the rushing championship. I think, uh, I think Nick Chubb had like Nick Chubb actually had it until, until like the very end, Nick Chubb had like 1,494 yards. And then Derrick Henry had like that monster game. Uh, in the final week to kind of push them over the top at 15 40. So like the yardage total really wasn't that different the year before uh, the difference came in the, the TDs and Derrick Henry is obviously, you know, a TD monster and he has a monopoly over the goal line. But I do think Nick Chubb provides a little bit more on the receiving end, right? You know, Nick Chubb last year had like 49 targets this year. I think he had like 18, but he played what, like, 12 games so he played 12 I, or 14 games yeah yeah i think i think he played 12 games and you put up a thousand yards in 12 games so nick chubb was again on pace for another 1500 yards so both these guys you're basically choosing between two of the best pure runners in the league so you can't really go wrong uh but you know i think if i'm just pure, judging really based on talent i think nick chubb's a better runner um and i think going forward I don't really see Cleveland letting him walk. And I know Kareem Hunt is there too, but Kareem Hunt, I remember we had this debate like in the off season too. People were like, oh, wow, like Kareem Hunt without Nick Chubb is better than Nick Chubb without Kareem Hunt. I was like, please, child, please. Uh, Nick, Nick Chubb's Nick Chubb's like a freaking monster. And we kind of see it in and out. And I'm just playing the value game here. So Derrick Henry will be, I guess, 27, right? When the season starts. Mm-hmm. I believe he has like a January birthday. So that means he'll be like 28. Uh, so odds are in his favor, but also, you know, Derrick Henry is definitely not human, uh, is what I've determined. He is an absolute Titan. He's been stomping on all of us at BDG for, he's killed you know, so many people virtually that I don't think yeah. he has so many bodies he's really got on him. It's yeah. ridiculous. He killed me. He killed Nick. He killed you. The only one that's been right about him and rightfully so is animal. And he's yeah. just been, he's been living the high life off of Derrick Henry and good on him because this guy is, he's going around, he's taking heads and animals just sitting in the corner, like praising him and. It's been working out, so I appreciate that from him. Yeah, definitely. And the workload is insane, though, right? I mean, he went from 215 in 2018 to 300 uh, carries and now to 370 touches. So you cannot fade that type of volume. And I kind of agree with you, Noah, that like that volume is probably here to stay this year. Uh, I don't know where that volume goes like after that. Um, so I think shelf life wise, like Nick Chubb probably has a little bit more shelf life than he does. Um, and so if I'm playing for value, I'm going to go Nick Chubb. But if I am a top contender and I'm pushing all my chips in this year, I am perfectly okay with going the route of Derrick Henry because you cannot fade that type of volume. And he's basically a lock for another 350 plus touches. And I think Nick Chubb's a lock for 300 touches, 300 um, touches as well. Uh, when you combine both rushing and receiving, I think he's probably going to be in the 300, 320 range because he's just too good to keep off the field. And also we saw this year, you know, TD's kind of swung back in his favor, whereas last year he couldn't get in worth a damn. This year he scored 12 touchdowns in 12 games. So uh, look, I think th- this is like a really, really close one. It's a tough decision to make. And I think it really just depends on where your team is at. You know, if you're, if this is like really your last year and you, you know, you kind of see, you're seeing like the end of the tunnel and you really have to go for it and like really, really swing for the fences. I think Derrick Henry is a better play. But if you're someone that's not sure, you know, your team is pretty damn good and, and you think you are a contender, but you kind of want to have a little bit more flexibility. Uh, I think I would go Nick Chubb because if Chubb goes out and has another year, like he did in his, uh, what is his, his, his second year, um, which was like another 300 carry, like 1500 yard or 1500 rushing and plus another 300 receiving on the, on the back end. I think you're, ta- you're looking at like a 25 year old Nick Chubb where he could be in the first round 
of dynasty startup conversation, right? And I don't think you'll get there with Henry. Even if he goes out and has another monster year, I think he's past the point where you can kind of get that first round value for him. So if you care about value at all, I would probably go Nick Chubb. So that's kind yeah, of I remember we had that about. discussion last offseason, like, oh, if Derrick Henry does what he did again, he's not going to be a first round pick. He did more than what he did. Now in the <laughs> mock drafts that I was part of, I got him in the third round of almost every single one. He was almost falling to the fourth. I'm like, okay, give me the rushing champion who's probably going to be the rushing champion once more. So I agree with you on that side of things where if you want to bet on somebody either accruing or holding value, Nick Chubb is probably the play. I mean, we've seen a play out with a guy like Ezekiel Elliott who, grand scheme of things, taking into consideration the offensive line and Dak Prescott going down, he didn't have a completely terrible season. But now, what is he, the RB like 12 off the board, RB 13? Whereas mm-hmm. in reality, if he did have a normal season under normal circumstances, he probably would have held steady. But the whole age thing, the whole touches that they they accrue on their portfolio, on their on their resume, it definitely plays a factor. So if you're not in it for this upcoming season or maybe just a two-year window, then yeah, probably go for Nick Chubb because you know even if you're not competing, he might bring you to that point. And if he doesn't, you'll at least have a window to sell him. So if you have guys like Julio Jones and Adam Thielen and a bunch of other older productive assets – Nick Ch- or Derek Henry is probably a better fit for your team than a guy like Nick Chubb. I'm not saying that you shouldn't go out and get Nick Chubb. If that's what your team is made of. Just if that's your core and you know that you're riding them out for this year, and then you're going to have to rebuild and do a productive struggle for the next 10, then Derek Henry can probably bring you to the promised land. Now, a debate that was heavily, heavily argued and brought upon. And I think the 2018 draft, Josh Jacobs versus Miles Sanders, who among us would have thought that both these guys would have been argued and David Montgomery is the golden child of the bunch. <laughs> now we're looking at Josh Jacobs who is going slightly ahead of Miles Sanders per BDGE ADP as the RB14, whereas Sanders is the RB16, both actually going ahead of David Montgomery. So he's flying a little bit under the radar, but hopefully he doesn't fly too close to the sun. Shout out Icarus. Me personally, actually, I'm going to ask you first, Mike, who do you like more? Because I know you, as well as myself, we weren't huge fans of Miles Sanders coming out of college. We didn't think he was all that talented. He could catch passes. He was athletic, but we didn't think he was a great runner. Whereas Josh Jacobs didn't have much to show up coming out of Alabama. He definitely had a great rookie season. He looked like one of the better runners in the league. Then he kind of dipped a little bit, and this year was kind of up and down. So who who do you, you prefer, either at value or just objectively one for one? Who would you rather have on your dynasty squad? Yeah, I'm still a pretty big fan of Miles Sanders. So I made a I was a big flipper. So I I originally really, really loved Jacobs coming out of college. I thought, you know, him being a very good receiver out of the backfield will translate very well to the NFL. Uh, and I didn't think Miles Sanders was really that good as a runner, to be honest, coming out of college. I thought he was he was like, you know, people try to compare him to Saquon Barkley because they're both super athletic. They went to PSU, but they're like miles apart. And I didn't even think he was that good of a receiver. I thought Josh Jacobs coming out of college was a better receiver than Miles Sanders. But at some point, you got to wake up to reality. And the reality is Raiders just are not using him as such. They are not using him enough in the receiving game, even though they got bums out there uh, trying to play wide receiver outside of Darren Waller, the God. Uh, hey, so it's the first round pick you're talking about. <laughs> a bum. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they got they got some dudes out there. Uh, other than Nelson Aguilar, the God, nobody was really catching passes out there um, from the wide receiver group. So I would have thought, they would use him more. And Mike Mayock came out and said, look, we're going to use Josh Jacobs more. This is the next step in his game. You know, so I, I bought into that. I'm like, and the first game came around. What happened? He had a ton of targets. I'm like, All right, this is it. Josh Jacobs, top five upside unlocked. And then it was just like getting kicked in the nuts game after game. GMs uh, do two things. Over, overdraft, fast, overdraft fast receivers and then lie straight to your face about <laughs> what they're going to do for their fantasy production. Like he drafted Henry Ruggs and then he didn't throw the ball to Josh Jacobs. It was just a confluence of events that really kicked us as, in the nuts, as you just said. Yeah, so, you know, since then, I've kind of pivoted to Miles Sanders last year and I got a lot of Miles Sanders last year on my teams and I was super pumped, super excited because I, I liked what he see. I liked what I saw in the receiving game, what he was doing. I liked the Philly O-line and then what happened? Again, proceeded to get kicked directly in the nuts because their O-line collapsed. Carson Wentz folded into the ginger that he is. And I just it just wasn't it just was not good. I mean, he had no confidence throwing the ball. And throwing short for Carson Wentz last year was one of the most painful experiences. I mean, if you just I don't I have think the time he finished for this. the year with like 70 targets and 30 something receptions. I'm gonna check that it right was, now. It was something terrible. It was awful. And Miles Sanders, you know, he had some drops as well. But if you guys go back and check the tape, and this is not something I say lightly because I barely watch any tape, but I did watch a lot of Philly because I wanted to figure out what the hell was going on. Carson Wentz could not hit Miles Sanders in the flat if his life depended on it. It was 
absolutely brutal. It's like it's like that like a, that scene from from uh, Bird Box. Where he just literally put blindfolds on. He was like thrown into the dirt, way overthrowing him, throwing it behind him. So it was absolutely brutal, and I hated it. And it was an absolutely painful experience. And Miles Sanders did not return the value that I thought he would. But he was still dominant in terms of opportunity. So unlike Josh Jacobs is getting pulled out the field every single time it was third down, Miles Sanders was still rocking like an 80% snap share. So from that perspective, I'm just looking at it from a pure volume perspective. I prefer Miles Sanders to Josh Jacobs because even though he doesn't, you know, he didn't pan out that well last year, he's still getting the target volume. Um, the downside is obviously you run the risk with a Jalen Hurts, right? Jalen Hurts, we just talked about with Taysom Hill. Although not to that degree, he does not dump off. Like Jalen Hurts is looking to take off. He's looking for the deep play. You know, people talk about Jalen Hurts' awful completion percentage. It, if you look at the types of throws that he's making, he's always looking downfield. Like his adjusted uh, net yards, adjusted yards per attempt is way up there. So his completion percentage actually isn't that bad when you take that into consideration. What I do think is the coaching, hopefully, is going to teach him and show them that, hey, look, like you got to take some of these first downs that are presented to you by Sanders, you know, by, you know, Goddard, some of these, some of these dump offs in the flat, you got to hit them in stride. So I'm hoping that there's some upside there, but this is like, I'm, I have major, major concerns on both, but I have much less concerns about Miles Sanders because I've seen them, seen them use it that way. And I think, I think that, I think that he actually has a chance to kind of regain some of that, you know, receiving volume that we, that we saw. And then he also has like very little risk in terms of competition in the backfield. Like they're not, there's not going to pull him off for no damn reason uh, going forward. You know, it's wild to me. You brought up that Carson Wentz was targeting him more heavily and Jalen Hurts doesn't throw to him too much. If you look at his paces with the two, Jalen Hurts only targeted him at a clip that would have paced out to 56 targets, whereas Carson Wentz was 76. But the receptions, because Carson Wentz was so inaccurate, yeah. came out to 36 for Hurts, 38 for Carson Wentz. And so bad. It's terrible. And as you said, right, it was around, I think that is exactly 50% catch rate. Obviously, Miles Sanders did a terrible job catching the ball sometimes, right? He dropped a few touchdown passes. Mm -hmm. He dropped a few over the shoulder that could have been big plays. But at the same time, there's so many screen plays where Carson Wentz, sure, he was getting blown up in the backfield because their offensive line was in shambles. But those are throws you got to make. And Jalen Hurts, you know, had four-game sample. And it's kind of hard to draw off of a four-game sample to either, you know, write off Miles Sanders or hype him up based on what happened. But what I can say is there's a changing of the guard in the coaching staff, right? Doug Peterson is gone. No more of this bullshit RBBC. They bring in my boy from LA, Shane Steichen. What did he do? He put Austin Eckler on half a hamstring on the field, catching eight balls a game, nine balls a game, 10 balls a game, right off of his hamstring coming off the bone with a ligament injury in his knee, I believe. He was not healthy, yet they used him as a workhorse. They used Kalen Balaj as a pseudo workhorse in the wake of Austin Eckler's absence. Although it may not be a 90% snap share or an 85% snap share for Miles Sanders, last year with Doug Peterson, he was around an 80% snap share for a lot of his games, at least 70%, most of them. If I run through his games, not including the ones he got hurt, right? 77, 78, 77, 85, he gets hurt. And then 72, 60, 61, 56, 81, 82, 78. He's around that 75 to 80% snap share with a guy like Steichen there, bring in Nick Sirianni, who kind of saw last year in Indianapolis, Jonathan Taylor come into his own and finally start to use him heavily down the stretch. I think looking at the talent in that backfield, they're going to use Miles Sanders as he should be used. And talking about Jalen Hurts, maybe stealing goal line carries. Yeah, that's, that's a chance. But in the last four games of the season, Miles Sanders had four goal line carries and obviously four divided by four is one times 16 pace it out for the whole season, 16 goal line carries, which would have ranked behind Derrick Henry, who had 17 would have been the sixth most in the league. Obviously it's kind of stupid to extrapolate that type of data, but just seeing that, you know, he's not completely phased out of the goal line game as he was early in the year when Corey Clement and Boston Scott were running in touchdowns while he was on the bench or when he was hurt. So I am kind of warming up to Miles Sanders. And on the flip side, I think we talked about Josh Jacobs not too long ago in a previous video mm -hmm. it's it's tough i was a huge fan of him but he, and he finishes like the rb13 the rb8 in his first two years in the league but it's every week you don't know if he's going to be 100 percent. he always has these nagging injuries you really rely on him getting into the end zone for him to score right all of his fantasy production this year wasn't on yards wasn't on receptions it was tied to touchdowns if he doesn't score he's not very useful and how many times did we see this year? A guy like Devontae Booker, one of the biggest Jags in the league, just continue to steal touches, continue to steal goal line work because they don't want to give Josh Jacobs the full reins. And we saw that in college, and now it's kind of playing out in the NFL. So 
not that I, I don't want any shares of Josh Jacobs, but honestly, I'd probably prefer Dave Montgomery to him. And at this point, I'm going to prefer Miles Sanders to him as well. And at his price, like guys like Antonio Gibson, Cam Akers, other running backs in that range are going ahead of him. He's around Ezekiel Elliott. Give me all of them over Josh Jacobs because we've seen for two straight years how this team wants to use him. And for me personally, a running back that doesn't catch passes, who isn't running for 1,600 yards a year, who's consistently banged up and relies heavily on touchdowns is not an asset that I want. So for me, I'm going Miles Sanders. I completely changed the script. I flipped the script. I changed my tune on a guy like Josh Jacobs. And I'm going to go with the Penn State running back in hopes that he redeems Nick this year and doesn't punch us in the face like Derrick Henry has for the past <laughs> two seasons. Yeah, it's uh, I'm, I'm excited to see what happens with that offense. You know, there's also the chance that, you know, Jalen Hurts is not the quarterback there, right? Like, you know, what if they what if they move up and, and grab their QB of the future who who will probably give a little bit more receiving volume? So there's a lot of question marks there in Philly. We don't know what's going to happen, but, you know, what I know is, excuse me, I want to buy into that opportunity share. So if, if TD start going his way, if the if he stops getting uh, balls thrown to him in the dirt, uh, I think it's going to be wills up for Miles Sanders. I think he has really high upside, which is why I was super high on him last year. So interested to see how that plays out. The last duo versus that we want to talk about here is an interesting one. And I'm sure uh, we have differing opinions on this, but it's Aaron Jones, the God, the TD, the TD God, absolute best in class and versus Joe Mixon. Aaron Jones currently going at RB 20 overall, pretty low in, in the VDG uh, ADP. We got Joe Mixon, going at RB21. I think I know your answer here, but I'm going to pass it to you first. Noah, who do you got? You know the answer. The audience knows the answer. I'm not a huge fan of Joe Mixon. I'm really high on Aaron Jones in comparison to where other people have him ranked in terms of dynasty. The reason why I'm not too high on Joe Mixon is because <laughs> he just is that one guy who's always a year away from being a year away. It's kind of like that guy, was Bruno Caboclo in the NBA, some niche player who his workout footage going into the NBA draft was him in a gym dribbling around folding chairs and them saying, oh yeah, he's two years away from being two years away from being Kevin Durant. The guy never ended up being anything. Same thing with Joe Mixon, right? He is in an offense that we thought was going to throw the ball a lot when Zach Taylor came over because he was part of that regime that Sean McVay, Boy Wonder, established in LA that brought Todd Gurley up from like 46 to 64 receptions. It's been a few years now. That didn't happen. Oh, their offensive line's getting better. They had Billy Price. They had Jonah Williams, who Nick Saban said is the best prospect that's ever come out of Alabama. They've been hurt. They've been on the field. That hasn't happened. The offensive line hasn't been great. Their quarterback situation, to no fault of his own, Joe Burrow is probably not going to be on the field early next season. If he is, he's not going to be 100%. How good is that offense going to be with a less than 100% Burrow? How good is it going to be with a backup quarterback like Ryan Finley or whoever else they add in the offseason? It's not going to work out too well. So although there is an age gap there, although there is the fact that Aaron Jones is perceived to be more fragile, although they came into the league at the same time, and Aaron Jones has played four more games than, than Joe Mixon, and Joe Mixon was nowhere to be found the second half of the season, although you can make those arguments, how, how, how I look at it is, you know, Joe Mixon, when do we realistically expect him to be a viable fantasy asset, right? He's being drafted as, what, the RB 18 or 19? Can you draft an RB at that range? You don't draft 21, them. 21, I think. 21. You don't draft them to expect them to be the RB 21. You draft them because they have the upside of a top 10, top eight, top five running back. And although not everybody inside the top 21 can be a top five running back, you hope for that upside. I see that upside with Aaron Jones as the RB 20 off the board because he's been a top six running back the past two years. Only he and Dalvin Cook have caught or have seen 60 targets, double digit touchdowns and a thousand rushing yards each of the past two years. He's been a top six running back, although on a great offense, and that might not be the case after free agency, we've seen him produce. Whereas Joe Mixon, it just seems like he keeps disappointing us year in, year out. And when Joe Burrow does get healthy, guess what he did a lot last season? Take a lot of goal line carries, one yard plunges. So if the receiving game isn't there, if the breakaway runs aren't there, if the goal line work or the goal line opportunity is a little bit capped because of the quarterback, that's just not an asset that I have too much faith in. Whereas with Aaron Jones, right, he's a free agent. And the likelihood of him landing on an offense as good as Green Bay is not very high. Whoever's going to pay him is probably going to use him a lot more than what Green Bay used him as. They used him as an, in a timeshare with A.J. Dillon down the stretch. They have used him with Jamal Williams throughout the past few seasons. Whoever wants to pay him money, whether it's Miami, whether it's any other team that has some cap, San Francisco probably doesn't have any cap, but 
NFL salary cap is kind of fake. Whoever's going to pay him a lot of money is going to use him like we saw with Le'Veon Bell, like we've seen with Melvin Gordon, like we've seen with other free agent running backs. So I have faith that wherever he goes, he's going to get touches. Although the efficiency may dip, the volume will probably work itself out and balance that out. So I'm going to go with Aaron Jones here as the RB20 off the board, despite being older, despite being a more fragile, I guess you could think of, but not really, asset. I'm going to go with him just because I think the upside is there and he has the floor that you know he brings in the receiving game as well. Yep. So all great points. I'm going to approach this from a little bit of a different angle here. Uh, so in my ranks, I got Joe Mixon, Aaron Jones, and James Robinson back to back to back or bike to bike to bike, as a godfather would say. Uh, so why do I have him there? Because it's a trade-off that I'm making. And I have him in the same tier, so I wouldn't necessarily give up one for the other. But obviously, I ranked Joe Mixon ahead for now. Uh, and it's because of the timing. Like Right now, I don't know what's happening with free agency. And as great as Aaron Jones is, I don't think there's any spot out there that's better for him than Green Bay Packers. Do you agree with that? Noah? I think Miami would be pretty good just because they ran Miles Gaskin into the ground. I think he's a lot better than Miles Gaskin. But yeah, if he were to land anywhere else, it would be a pretty low likelihood that it matches what Green Bay could bring him. So you think Miami would be like the same as, as Green Bay Packers, like a wash, basically? I don't think the efficiency would be the same, but I think the volume would help sustain that or supplement that. Got it. Yeah. So I'd be worried about touchdowns uh, in the, on the Miami squad, unless they bring in like a Watson, Miami plus Watson. I'm all in right. Miami less Watson. I'm less in, but basically my, my theory comes down to this. Like, I don't know where he's going to go, but chances are it's, it might, it probably won't be green Bay. Cause they, they, they can't really afford it. And if it's not green Bay, it's going to be worse no matter what, in my opinion, uh, unless it's San Francisco. I think San Francisco is actually one other spot where I think it could probably match Green Bay Packers because he would go there and relegate, you know, Jeff Wilson Jr. And uh, fuck, what's, what's his name? Raheem I mean, Mostert. So, yeah, Raheem Mostert uh, to the bench. So, but we know with Joe Mixon, like, I, I know what he is. And yeah, he's been disappointing. Trust me, I understand. I've been a Joe Mixon truther since college. I've never let it go. And I let it go for a bit this midseason. But seeing him go at the RB21, First of all, both these guys are going a bit too low for me. I have them both as like a middling a middling RB2 versus like a late RB2. So I think both have upside. But I think this year we saw a little bit of what Joe Mixon could be. He was getting more and more involved in the passing game. And I remember having this discussion with you and Nick in season when he had like that nice game of like nice game receptions and then everyone was like selling, sell, sell, sell. And I'm like, no, nah, like I want to see like what this looks like going forward, right? So you know, he had four targets the second game, three targets his third game, six targets his uh, fourth game, eight targets his uh, fifth game, and three targets in his sixth game before getting hurt, right? So I think that's that's what I really wanted to see. You know, he had 26 targets over six games. So you, you're looking at someone getting into that, like, 60 to 70 target range. And Joe, Bing, Joe Mixon, coming out of college, why I loved him so much was because I felt like he was one of the best receivers in that class. Now he fell in the draft. Cause he's an idiot and he hit a, he hit someone, he hit a girl and punched her in like the parking lot or something, which is obviously an idiotic move. But talent wise, I felt like Joe Mac, Joe Mixon was the most talented back in that, in that class. And if we go back to the RB God himself, Graham Barfield, Joe Mixon in his yards created is one of like the gods of, of running backs over that, that have come out in like the past little while. So I'm, I'm admittedly, I'm still hanging on to that profile a little bit, but I was given a little peek under the Konomo this year and I saw some targets and I saw some reception. I'm like, damn, I like, I like how that looks and I'd like to see some more of it. So that coupled, coupled with the security of his gig. And I don't even know where Gio Bernard is going to be, if he's going to be relevant at all. Um, and with Joe Burrow coming back and I think it sounds like they're going to add someone else to the offensive line. Now I'm not going to overreact and say, Hey, that makes him a great offensive line. Cause we've been through that ride before. I'm not making that mistake until I see it again. But I think Joe Mixon is talented enough with that offense, uh, with the goal line work, with his increase in targets to provide us that like top 10 upside again. Uh, so for those reasons, and because of where we're at in the season before free agency and not knowing where Aaron Jones is going, that's the only reason why I have Joe Mixon there. If Aaron Jones resigns with Packers, if Aaron Jones lands in San Francisco, if Aaron Jones goes to Miami and they land some, some big names in free agency and maybe lands with Deshaun Watson, I will absolutely catapult Aaron Jones up my rankings a little bit. But for now, because of those question marks, because of the uncertainty, that's why I have Joe Mixon uh, where I have him for now.
And it's the same thing. The first time in a while where we've had this many running backs, right? The fact that Aaron Jones is RB20, Joe Mixon's RB21, whereas both these guys last offseason were top 10 assets. And that's really to no fault of their own that they're this low. I mean, Joe Mixon, right? I'm not a huge fan of, but he did get injured. People are kind of forgetting about him. But there's so many young assets who are on their own teams. And it kind of helped out that Cam Akers went to his own squad, that Antonio Gibson went to his own squad. Everybody who got drafted last year landed in a spot where they didn't really relegate a an established asset unless you were a Daryl Henderson truther. So I think the fact that the league is literally 22, 23 starting running backs deep. And I think once you get to the Damien Harris level, that's when you can kind of lose a little bit of confidence in having a top end asset. But waiting till the fourth or fifth round and having your RB1 and RB2 be Aaron Jones and Joe Mixon after stacking up a few quarterbacks and maybe adding a wide receiver in the mix, I mean, that's not a bad start. If you're at the end of the first and you start with Trevor Lawrence, Deshaun Watson, Justin Jefferson, Joe Mixon, Aaron Jones, I mean, count your lucky stars because you're probably going to be the Scott of your league and just absolutely run train on everybody. So I think the main takeaway here, aside from just looking at the values of these players and what you can maybe flip in terms of adding an asset on top of another one, because all these guys are very close. And I think we were on the opposite side of everybody except for Miles Sanders. I think that's just a point to say, you know, if you can get Aaron Jones plus for Mixon or flip that, if you can get Mixon plus for Jones, that's a, that's a move you can probably make and a move that I would probably capitalize on as well. And that'll just set you up for the long run. So I think those main takeaways from this video are going to be helpful. And I think next week when we do the wide receivers as well, Mm -hmm. it's going to be helpful as well, because that's really when it gets down to the point where, you know, trading within tiers. And if maybe you think a guy's within a tier that really isn't, at least in our opinions, that's when you can capitalize it on value. We all know the top five, top 10 wide receivers are all basically the same shit. When you get to wide receiver 20 through 35, it's probably about the same thing as well. So you can really capitalize on flipping those assets, but running backs, it's a bit harder. So I hope that these, what eight guys, could help you out a little bit in that aspect. Yeah, I think I think what's what's cool here is we we purposely kind of picked one from like each grouping, each tier, and almost each round, so you can kind of have a pick and and plan your draft out if you go QB early, which seems like you kind of have to do a little bit this year, so you don't get caught with like you know Mitch Trubisky and Sam Darnold as your quarterbacks. Trust me, that's not fun. I, that's not a joke. I've, I've had a roster with that before, um, but I think it's just it's just interesting because like you said. You know, what happened was in 2020, we got a massive injection of really talented running backs, right? We got DeAndre Swift, Jonathan Taylor, uh, J.K. Dobbins, Cam Akers, uh, CEH, Antonio Gibson. So James you have Robinson, a, don't forget. the. Oh, guy. yeah. Sorry. James Robinson, the God, obviously. And so you basically had like seven starter worthy, starter worthy RB1 upside running backs that are all 21 to 22 years old. And that's why you're seeing guys like Joe Mixon, like Aaron Jones fall down a little bit, because otherwise, you know, these guys coming off the years, Aaron Jones coming off the year that he did, there, there's no way that he should be a, a third or, or fourth round pick if we didn't have those stud rookies, right? So it's just a really interesting year where, you know, the dead zone is always that like round three to six for running backs. But as I'm seeing like some of these guys fall, someone like a Joe Mixon fall into the third, fourth round, I'm like pretty comfortable, you know, firing a clip on him and having him be my top running back if I go like QB early or something like that. So I'm going to be playing around with drafts a lot and I'm playing around the ADP. And obviously ADP will, will evolve over time, but but it's definitely interesting to see some of this stuff. And, you know, you kind of saw me and Noah debate like, and we had differing opinions on all of them, but we were all st- still somewhat close, right? So it really comes down to where you think your team is at you know, what your goals are. Are you trying to retain some value? Are you trying to have flexibility or are you trying to push all your chips in the middle and just go for it? So I think those are the key things you need to make a true honest assessment of your roster and your team, and then, you know, make that decision. Right. So that's why, you know, it might've sound like Noah and I were not giving you a very, very like firm answer, but because there's really no need to take a hard stance here. I think these, these guys are really fluid. They're close for a reason. And we kind of agree with their ADPs for a reason to a degree. Uh, so that's why we're not going to be like, well, one guy stinks and one guy doesn't. So just, just kind of really understand your team, understand where you're at to make that kind of decision. So yeah. And I also all- think it'll be helpful in the comments for next week, because we are doing wide receivers. If you guys have questions and you know that they're probably close within our own rankings, maybe like a Cortland Sutton versus a Jerry Judy, and they're on the same team. So that might be a little bit tough and it's not going to help you but like a Cortland Sutton versus a Robert Woods or a Kenny Galladay. And there's something you want us to go into they're within the same tier within the same area of rankings kind of how we did in this video we'd love to add them to the show sheet and talk about them next week because you know helping you guys is is great and this is kind of like flying blind like we don't know what you guys wanted us to talk about and we kind of just picked by looking at rounds and bdg adp but being more specific and incorporating your guys's ideas is probably going to give you guys a better understanding and then even if your questions don't get answered i think applying these same theories and the same 
uh, analysis that we use for the examples that we do pick out of the comments is going to help you in the long run as well. It's mostly just looking at guys in the same tier and trying to capitalize off of value gaps that don't really exist, whereas your league mates may think that they exist. Yep, absolutely. All right. Hope you guys enjoyed that episode. If you did, make sure you hit the subscribe button, both to the Big Dogs main channel and also to the Bunk Bed Breakdowns YouTube channel. Uh, it'll it'll really, really help us. We're trying to grow our subscribers there so that we can spew our nonsense to more and more people, whether it's you know NFL Dynasty, whether it's NBA Top Shots, whether it's Noah's hair, whether it's Noah's new frames, you know, lots of stuff to talk about throughout throughout the offseason. A lot of character guys, changes going on. <laughs> we're going to keep you guys busy uh if follow noah at fb god on twitter follow me at mike me up with two p's on twitter and then also if you're into nba top shots you can catch the videos on this channel but also make sure you check out noah's new channel which is nba dedicated you know content it's got funny content it's got knowledgeable content if you're trying to get your toes wet the markets are down right now in NBA Top Shots, so it's probably a good time to get in there. When there is blood in the water, you want to be a shark. That is my investment philosophy, even though this is not investment advice. So remember that. Very, yeah, very big chain. Big. No real financial advice over yeah. here. Big chain. So, yeah, like you said, drop in the comments. Give us a thumbs up. You know, Let us know what you want to see, and we're going to do our best to kind of fulfill those wishes. Your wish is not my command, but we will put it into consideration. Uh, so that's the best we can do for you. That's all we got for you. See you guys next week. Actually, no, see you guys later in the week for the NBA Top Shots video. Or if you're not down to that, then see you guys next week for the weekly show. Channel, chat, I'm on. Foolies, glad I'm on. Even my haters kind of glad I'm on. Rest in peace to my bag up on. Rap a song, singer, suspended subpoena from Mr. Meaner's dreamer. Hell back asses, Loki still is in. And I still shake a bow squat. Ram on my broke, got a city on the come.